I've been teaching for a long time. I started out as a special ed teacher at a residential school. And as co-chair of a department, my job was to write programs and to do classroom teaching and sheltered workshop teaching for those students who would never leave a sheltered environment. Then for 12 years, I taught high school students math and biology and chemistry. And for over 20 years now, I've been a university professor in both departments of psychology and biology. And along the way, I've done athletic coaching for a number of years. So I've seen teaching from a variety of perspectives. And I've had the opportunity to teach, my clicker isn't working. I've had the opportunity to teach a number of absolutely wonderful students. Could you advance the slides for me? That's not my slide. <laughs> Thank you. So I've had the opportunity to teach a lot of absolutely wonderful students. And those students have taught me three lessons about teaching that I'd like to share with you today. The first lesson that I've learned from my students is that good teaching is the same no matter what you're teaching. It involves a caring relationship between two people, a teacher and a learner. And the caring part of that relationship has to be expressed explicitly and verbally, both by the teacher and by the student. And the classroom, the learning environment, has to be a safe place. It has to be a place where teachers and students feel free to voice opinions, to come up with new ideas, to try new things without fear of ridicule or being told that they're wrong. And like all good relationships, the re teaching relationship has to be built on honesty. Honesty on the part of the teacher and honesty on the part of the student. I'm sorry, but we're still not clicking. Could you advance it for me? The second lesson that I've learned is good teaching is difficult, but it's not complicated. It doesn't take Google tablets or smart boards or complicated websites or rigid lesson plans or complex grading rubrics. In fact, these are precisely the things that are interfering with good teaching in our classrooms now. Now, I'm not a technophobe. As a matter of fact, I'm a bit of a computer geek. But I realize that technology doesn't substitute for the relationship that should be teaching any more than me posting to your Facebook page substitutes for me having an actual real relationship with you. And the third thing that I've learned from my students is that the way we teach math and science is completely wrong. And it's wrong because it's inconsistent with biology. And if it's inconsistent with biology, that means it's inconsistent with the way that our brains work. And I find this sort of unusual because learning is biology. You see, if there isn't actually a physical change in your brain, there is no information there. That's what information is. Just like if there isn't actually a physical change in the relationship between your brain and your muscles, your athletic ability hasn't improved. So think about the problem this way. Every year we hear about some crisis in education. Am I right? This year, it's the park test. The Park test is a test that was administered to high school students to determine the degree to which they meet the standards that are established by the new Common Core curriculum. And if you believe the results of the Park test, just about 17% of our students meet the math criteria. Now, why is it that we hear about this kind of crisis every year, but we never hear about a crisis that sounds like this? Oh my god, those high school football players. They're just getting smaller and weaker every year. Or, oh man, those sprinters just can't meet the sprinting criteria. I've got nobody to put, put on the team. Why don't those crises occur to us? It's all physiology. Why is it that we're so bad at teaching physiology above the neck, but we're so good at teaching physiology below the neck? Well, I think the reason is, is that because sports, and dance and playing a musical instrument, for that matter, are taught in ways 
that are consistent with the ways that our brains work. And math and science aren't. And I think that if we just make a few head-to-head -head comparisons between the way these two domains are taught, the differences become starkly evident. So for instance, in athletics, athletes are taught toward a global goal. And that global goal is winning the contest or winning the meet. And meeting that global goal, accomplishing that global goal, means coming up with an unusual solution to an unexpected problem. And coaches know that athletes may use different sets of skills from competition to competition, and individual athletes may use different sets of skills within a given competition. But we don't teach math and science in terms of global goals. In general, math and science are taught in small goals that are often unrelated and can be taught in random orders. So for instance, in a high school biology class, one week a student might be learning the steps in cellular respiration. And the next week, they might be learning the levels in an ecological system. And in the next week, they might be learning how dinosaurs evolved. You have to help me with the clicker, please. There we go. And it's hard for me, even as a biologist, to understand what the global goal is in this kind of teaching. In the second place, in sports, we assess athletes honestly. And athletes recognize the fact that when they start the sport, they're not very good at the sport. And progress is going to happen gradually over time. And that progress is going to be related to how hard they study the sport or how much they practice. But we are not assessing students honestly in math and science classrooms. Let me give you an example. If you look at this graph, for instance, you'll see the average GPA of college students in the United States over the last century. Now, if you'll notice that in the early 1900s, the average GPA in college was a C, which is what it should be, right? Because C means average. But over time, the average GPA has escalated. Until now, the average GPA is a B, and in some places, it's well over a B. Well, this doesn't make sense to me, and it's inconsistent with what the standardized tests are telling us. So the PARC test is telling us that our students are very poorly prepared for college. University professors are telling us all the students are above average. Well, somebody's not telling us the truth here, right? And it seems to me that neither group of people are being honest in their assessments. I don't think we're as dumb as the PARC test says we are. And I don't think we're as smart as the university professors say we are. In a, in a related point, in sports, failure is valued. When athletes fail, and they know they're going to fail, they know they're going to make mistakes when out in the field, they pay attention to those mistakes. They examine those mistakes. They video those mistakes. They analyze and dissect those mistakes because they understand that understanding those mistakes is an avenue to improvement. In our classrooms, we've made students feel like being wrong is shameful. So for instance, in my classes, if I pose a question to the class, or I present a problem to the class, and I ask them how they, how they think they could solve the problem, I'm met with a sea of silence. And I'm met with a sea of silence, not because they don't have ideas, not because they can't come up with solutions, but because they're scared of being wrong. And I know this because I ask them. It takes me in my classes as much as three weeks, every semester in every class, to convince students that this is the place to be wrong. I want them to fail. I want them to try things and find out that things don't work. That's the process of education. The right answer isn't the end goal. It's learning how to get to the right answer that's the end goal of education. And in sports, we value individuality. If you think of the athletes that have made names for themselves in their respective sports, the athletes that we look up to, these weren't people that followed rubrics, that went lockstep with everybody else. These are people who thought out of the box. These are people who could come up with unusual or novel solutions to unexpected problems in both their training and in competition. But academia doesn't value this. Academia is set up to crush the individuality 
out of both teachers and students. So let me tell you a little story about my daughter Lizzie and an interesting microscopic aquatic animal called a Daphnia. My daughter's on the left, by the way. When she was at Niles West High School, she was in an AP biology class. And she and her partner were doing an experiment in which they were altering the heart rate of Daphnia by adding various chemicals to the water in which the Daphnia swam. So she asked me when she was done, Dad, would you take a look at this and tell me what you think? And of course, I said, sure. Well, I read it, and quite frankly, it was great. I said, you know, if an NEIU introductory biology student handed this in, I would give him an A. I said, you understood the problem, you did the experiments right, the analysis is good, your graphs are beautiful, and your conclusion makes sense. I think you're good to go. So Lizzie handed it in. Well, Lizzie got a C on this paper in biology. And she got a C not because there was anything wrong with the paper intellectually, but because the sections in the paper didn't match the order that was prescribed by the grading rubric. So what did this teach my daughter about science? Well, it taught her the biology sucks because it's not about coming up with a unique solution to an unexpected problem. It was all about following a set of rules. And finally, in sports, the test, the contest, the meet, the match is joyful. Athletes look forward to the match. This is a time when they can show off. This is a time when they can show everyone the skills that they've developed. And the competition, the test, matches the global goal of their training. And as a matter of fact, the competition is so enjoyable, we do them just for fun, right? But in science and math, the tests, the competitions, the places where students should feel that they have an opportunity to show off all the things they've learned are considered onerous. Nobody likes them. Everybody runs from them. And because they don't match any global goal, the students see them as one-time events, after which they can simply forget the skills that they've learned to do well on that test, because next week they're doing something different anyway. So the question is, can we change any of this? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. If students and administrators and teachers work together, this can be changed, and it can be changed relatively easily with just a few simple steps. The first thing we need to do is eliminate the command and control approach to teaching. It doesn't make sense to me that principals or administrators or school boards or publishers or corporations can tell a teacher, before the teachers ever met their students, exactly what things to teach, in exactly what time frame, and in exactly what order. See, this would be analogous to me being a little league coach and sitting in my office two weeks before the season starts, before I've ever met the boys and girls that I'm going to be working with, and saying to myself, well, when these kids show up, this is what I'm going to do. On Monday, we're going to practice running around the bases for an hour and 15 minutes. Then on Tuesdays, we're going to throw the ball for 45 minutes. Wednesday, we're going to learn to bat for two hours. And then on Thursday, we're going to field for well, an hour and 15 minutes. Then on Friday, I'm going to give them a quiz. And if they don't know how to play baseball, I'm going to kick them off the team. Does this make sense to anybody? What we need to do is replace rigid lesson plans and grading rubrics with broad teaching goals. And let teachers do what they do best, which is teach to the students that they have in that classroom at any given time. And this in itself is going to improve the quality of teachers in our classroom because what it's going to do is it's going to encourage people to enter the field who actually understand the material and can establish good teaching relationships with human beings. And it's going to discourage people from entering the field who really don't understand the material and can only follow a set of instructions that someone's handed them. And we need to embrace individuality in teaching and learning. You know, anybody with kids knows <laughs> that all people are not the same. Every coach knows that all athletes aren't the same. They think differently, they respond differently, they learn differently. And all teachers are different because they're all biological systems and all biological systems are unique. And we have to allow teachers and students the freedom to come up with new solutions and new ideas and new ways to present and new ways to understand and learn the material within broad structures in the classroom. And what I found is the only time that this is a problem 
is if you're being forced to cover a set amount of material in a set amount of time. And finally, we have to be honest with students and we have to embrace failure. This is very, very important. The right answer isn't the goal of teaching. So for instance, if I'm in a classroom and I pose a problem that I want students to wrestle with, and a discussion ensues, and this is part of education, right? It's a lively exchange of ideas. As the discussion is going on, inevitably, one or more students is going to raise their hand, and with all good intentions, say, hey, Dr. Preet, can you just tell us the answer to this? And I always say the same thing. I say, well, no, I can't. For one reason is that there isn't one answer to this problem. There isn't one answer to every problem that we face. There could be a whole host of answers. But there's a more important reason I can't tell you the, the answer, and it's this. The right answer is totally meaningless. See, it makes no sense for me to tell you the answer and then you to write it down on a piece of paper. That's not what education is. Education is about you learning how to get to the right answer. It's about you going through the process. Just like no one can go to the gym and work out for you, you have to go through the process. That's what learning is about, and that's what we have to teach our students. The right answer is completely unimportant in education. So this is not an easy way to teach. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of emotional commitment. But it's a simple way to teach. And it's effective because biological systems don't follow rubrics. In other words, life is messy. But teaching is joyful if you're doing it right. So you need to relax and enjoy it. And I think these are lessons we're sharing. Thank you.